<laughs> By the way, it's recorded. Yeah. yeah, welcome to the webinar series, part seven of the webinar series. Tonight we're going to talk about real estate investing with Don R. Campbell. And, uh, you know, Don, uh, I, I sometimes will make the assumption that everybody knows who you are, and et cetera. But, you know, I think it, 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 uh, it's very important not to just assume that. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Don Campbell is, um, and Don, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm doing this off the cuff, uh, co-founder of the Real Estate Investment Network. You've been working with the Real Estate Investment Network, Rain, for 20, how many years? Four. 24, 24 years. Wow, he started yeah. when he was 16. Yes, <laughs> let's go with that. Yeah, yeah and, and you know, um, first of all, Don's been investing in real estate himself for uh, more than 24 years, I'd say. Well, I'd go back to, what, 30 years ago you started? 1980s, man. Permanent. Wow. Permanent. Wow. We are uh, going to spare everybody those pictures of uh, okay, you good. with your fro and the shorts you wore in 1980s. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it's all, all joking aside, folks, uh, Mr. Campbell here has been investing in real estate for over 30 years, been involved as a leader and a thought leader, if you will, in the Real Estate Investment Network for 24 years and running. And in addition to being the president and brain trust behind Rain and taking it to where it is today, Don. Hey, wait a minute, Pete. I have to, I have to, I have to fix you on that. I'm the senior okay. analyst because now I have gray hair. So. Oh, there you uh, go. I'm not the president now. I'm the senior analyst. Uh, is not a, well, and as long as you don't have senior moments, then we're good. <laughs> we'll um, find out next hour, won't we? <laughs> exactly. So. Uh, Don, you, you, you've bought a lot of real estate, uh, you've written a lot of books, you are officially Canada's top best-selling author for Canadian real estate books, correct? True, that's for sure. Yep. Yeah, and, and, and to think it just started off as an idea and a, a way to make a couple of bucks for Habitat for Humanity, and then and it took off, because frankly, Pete, you know, there's always excuses to invest and not to invest, but people are want the truth and what you know about me is I'm not Mr. Hype or anything. I just analyze the markets and look at the numbers and say, yeah, you know what? You might want to adjust this or adjust that. And that's yeah. really important right now because I'm, you know, you and I talked about this last week and that's, there's so much noise out there right now. There's so much, uh, so much data that is being misinterpreted. There's so many, so many people that are making assumptions and, uh, and, and frankly, it's dangerous to do so. You know, you're, you're, I'm seeing it um, on on TV. I'm seeing it on uh, on stages around the country. I'm going, uh oh, this this feels like 1990 all over again when it was happening. So let's let's bust those myths in the next 54 minutes, shall we? Absolutely. You know, and and you hit the nail on the head there. There's a lot of um, uh, a lot of, I, mean, I don't want to call it hype, but you, 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 noise. You know, one of the things, uh, as you know, I'm uh, now doing what I call holistic financial planning, a holistic approach mm. to, uh, to uh, you know, the, the, the management of people's money. And when it comes to real estate and everything, a balance between real estate, private equity, and the markets. And, you know, uh, one of the things that people get a lot is that confusion, that noise. I, I'm, I'm confused. I'm lost. The most common thing I get, Don, when I'm sitting down and doing plans with individuals, I'm sitting down with them and they're saying, okay, well, I've got this much money and I want to put some money into the market, so I want to put some money into um, real estate. But the problem is they get so much attention from the media, and the media noise is saying, well, you know what, Vancouver, the bubble's about to burst. Uh, Alberta, well, you know, oil is, is plummeting, so you know you can't invest in Alberta. And Toronto is just as bad as Vancouver, but you can't put money in the stock markets because with the volatility and things that are going on in Europe, well, that's just a mess. And of course, <laughs> Lord knows what's going to happen when uh, whoever gets elected down south. And the you know, at, at, at one point, you couldn't be faulted for feeling a little negative or you're almost depressed. And uh, I think now more than ever before is the need to bring perspective to those conversations. Well, that's for sure, and and you know I, I don't get angry easy, and I don't get upset easy. But I think it was Tuesday or Monday I opened the paper. Yes, the one that's on paper, not on a screen. And, uh, and yeah. I see our who I who I respect highly, our um, Bank of Canada Governor Stephen Polos. Yeah, and he looks he's he's holding a press conference, and his press conference was the subtext was, okay, Canadians. We need you to lower your expectations on your retirement. Mm. And 
hey, Canadian businesses, we need you to lower your expectations on how your business is going to perform in the next five years. And I went, there is no way that I'm lowering my expectations. And, um, and I hope that none of my clients lower their expectations. But the subtext to that subtext is that um, we, if we really want to do something in the next year, if we're next five years, next ten years, as investors, as people who have lives, who have kids to put through uh, post-secondary education or want to retire and travel around the world or retire to some recreational pro whatever your goal is, um, what I heard in Stevens, uh, in, in Mr. Polos, excuse me, his, yep. his quote there was, we have to step up our game. We can't keep speculating. We can't keep seeing people throwing money at things and hoping for the best. The other side that I saw in that uh, note is that, that people are going to that people are going to start chasing returns, and f mm -hmm. and that leads to fraudulent opportunities to be brought up quietly in the back room. Listen, you know what? We can't tell you about this deal, but I shouldn't be telling you. But it's got eight percent guaranteed, and all that stuff. Exactly like the 1990s. I'm seeing it again. Um, that that you have to you have to start being smart, really smart, because if mm -hmm. the market's going to be that slow, whether it's housing or, or any financial market, according to our Bank of Canada governor, um, we have to be smart and strategic in everything we do. And that's why you know, actually, as a matter of fact, you you mentioned that you're doing that holistic approach, and that's brilliant because if somebody only has five years to to achieve whatever that financial goal is. You, you, you better go in a different route than if you have 20, 25 years. If you have zero risk tolerance, you shouldn't be doing A, you should be doing B. And unfortunately, um, if the economy slows down, the dollar collapses even further, um, the only jobs that are being created are government jobs, you know, those kind of things that are actually happening. And the OECD came out yesterday, was it yesterday? Mm -hmm. yes, yesterday to say, hey, sorry, Canada, but we're lowering your... Um, your forecast for your GDP growth by 30, over 30 percent. Um, you see all these messages. All that's telling me is that I have to pick up my game, and every one of us on this call needs to pick up their game in order to achieve what we need to achieve. Don't lower your expectation to expectations. Change raise your strategy. Game. Yeah, raise your game. And it could be a case of uh, status quo just isn't going to cut it anymore. Well, it may, but it'll give you uh, a less result that you're looking for. Let's say it that way. Mm. You know, there's the, there's the FOMO of, of Vancouver, right? Oh, if only 10 years ago I had put all my money into Vancouver, I'd be a genius. Mm. All right, you're going to have to explain FOMO. Not everybody knows what that is. Oh, means. sorry. Yeah, you've got to hang out with the teenagers, man. Mm. The fear of missing out, right? You see right, that? And right, right. Like, oh, my God, what's the next one? Oh, I'm going to go stick my money in Honduras because I heard that that's the big deal. It's like, oh, mm. Stop chasing this stuff and start looking at it strategically. You know, you know, if say for instance you decided you're going to, you're going to do a Vancouver or Toronto, and um, and it's just like going to Vegas, and you you walk up to the the, the roulette wheel and you only have you have a thousand dollars and you go that's it I'm going to do it I'm going to stick it on red, and somebody else puts their money on black it comes up black they double their money. You lose all your money, and that's exactly the same thing that can happen in these towns. Like Vancouver and Toronto done incredibly well, but mm -hmm. it could have been the exact opposite, as you saw in 08 and 09 in many, many cities in the United States. So you have to buy for cash flow. You have to buy where the economics are supporting the market, not just uh, speculation and buying. And if you do that and you start to crack the code, even a downturn such as downturn such as Calgary or, or Edmonton um, can actually eventually not right now maybe but eventually mm -hmm. provide you with a, a tremendous opportunity to speed up your returns. But once well, again, you, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, Don, you, you touched on something I want to really stress about. Uh, sure. Stress on rather. Uh, I don't want to stress about it. Uh, I want to focus <laughs> on the concept of uh, speculating versus investing because. 
you, you hit the nail on the head. I, I've talked to a lot of people who said, well, if I put, bought this in 2008 in Vancouver, I would have doubled my money. You know, maybe I should have done that or that. Well, maybe, but back in 2008, where were you? What was your financial situation? By the way, could you have dollars of negative cash flow? Yeah, you would have had negative cash flow. And, and one of the things I always remind people of is if you had made that decision at that point in time, you would have been speculating rather than investing. So we, we touch on that concept because I think it's a really important concept, the difference between speculating versus investing based on economic fundamentals. Sure, and I don't mind if you have a very small portion of your portfolio in speculative, um, you know, speculative investments. However, um, if that's all you're doing, um, it's kind of like the musical chairs game. You know, you've got five chairs and six people and the music in this case, the economy or the housing market is going and going and going and going, and then the music stops, and you better have a place to sit down or you lose. And unfortunately, uh, uh, speculators um, get themselves into trouble because they don't have a plan B, or the plan B is negative cash flow, two thousand dollars a month, trying to pay yeah. all their mortgage and their condo fees and their concierge fees and you know all that stuff that happens. So. Um, I've done incredibly well. I have 150. I counted yesterday. 151 um, doors, and, um, and so I have properties. And um, and the only time that I feel that I made a mistake, but unfortunately, but fortunately, I was good at research and was able to buy in the right spot. Um, the only one I made a mistake is is that I speculated on it, and mm. it's, and that's the one that you know came up and bit me, and it was silly. It was in the right economic town. It just wasn't the right type of property, and it wasn't, you know, I go, oh, this is the next neighborhood that's going to go, and I'm going to do this. And that, yeah. you know, was, that was over 10 years ago. But at the same time, we all get caught in it, you know, that throw, you know, a swing for the fence every once in a while. And it's not worth it. Well, it did Especially when the Bank of Canada governor just said, hey, lower your expectations, which tells you that, Things in the future will not be churning anywhere near as much as you're used to, and uh, so it's very, 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 very interesting to put that context over this whole thing. And that is, if you're guessing, if you're guessing, and you know you're guessing, and you're okay to lose the money, go for it. Okay, so what's, best. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, uh, no, I have that. I, I'm just saying, you know what? That's bang on. But I'm thinking, Don, let's shift gears here a little bit. Sure. And let's jump into some of the, the the negative talk that we're seeing out there in the marketplace right now. Um, you know, you hear um, people who are going to say, "Well, you know what? I, I got a headline. I don't. Know if, uh, I'm just showing a headline. Is fears grow a repeat of 2008 financial crash as investors run for cover." Uh, we we hear about uh, a lot of people speculating about what could happen in our our, our both our stock market and the Canadian housing market. JKD Capital. A group out of Boston came out with a housing report. This is Canadian housing on the ropes. Yeah, so again, Vancouver parents buy a property for young children to secure a future foothold. Um, the entire report basically is comparing the Canadian real estate market to um, you know the U.S. subprime crisis and trying <laughs> to suggest that we're right. You know, you know, this is a Boston investment group saying, hey, you know what? Can I, mean, I can do you one better. There's a, a, a I, I won't name them, but there's an economics firm out of Ottawa that since 2009 has said that that's it, the housing market in Canada is over. So yeah. as anybody on this call would know, the market's done pretty well for itself since 2009, but you could have been sitting on the sidelines since 2009 if you looked at that one opinion. You know, uh, uh, you know, a bit of a bit of a fan of what Warren Buffett has created, and the the, the one quote was, uh, you know, I'll show you how to get wealthy. Uh, lock your door and be fearful when others are greedy, and greedy only when others are fearful. I people are making decisions based on this quote, and that's just crazy. Because what if your research, and that's the key, your research, not from somebody who's trying to sell you something, but that research is saying, you know what, you should be fearful. Well, that doesn't matter. There's a quote on my office door that says, uh, "I got to be greedy when everyone's fearful," and then you go and make a mistake like that, and um, you go, you you will in the middle of the highs and the middle of the lows and all the way up and down. You can find these reports, and they're they're just much much more accessible now. 
now that the, now that this the interwebs exist and Google yeah. exists and everybody shares them on the on the Facebook. <laughs> Sorry, it's not like an old man, right? And uh, but 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 frankly, it's about and there's no such thing. You know, I, we talked about this on stage a couple of times. There's no such thing as a Canadian real estate market. Exactly. It, right? You, you know, what is it, the Inuvik market and Toronto market and Saskatoon market and the Winnipeg market are all contiguous, not even remotely. Look at what's happening in uh, Calgary versus Edmonton. Edmonton's still strong. Edmonton's still doing okay. It's getting tougher, but Calgary is having its collective handed to it yeah. and, uh, I, and, 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 and that momentum is starting to gain because it's, they're completely different economies. Yeah, you know, and, and it's, it's interesting. You, you, we, we don't even have to go from Calgary to Edmonton to talk about different markets. We live in Vancouver here. You're in Abbotsford, I'm in Vancouver, but like, honestly, with the, you can't compare Coal Harbor in downtown Vancouver to uh, just, just go uh, a 15-minute walk to just uh, on the other side of uh, – uh, gas down, and you're at uh, Hastings and Maine. <laughs> you know, a bit different, right? <laughs> completely yeah, and, different. Uh, yeah. For those, but that also know, you just mentioned Abbotsford, Abbotsford to Vancouver, right? Um, uh, Abbotsford is affordable. You can get cash flow. It's 48 minutes. How do I know from Gas Town? Um, except during the height of rush hour. Yeah, you have that's people. Midnight, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, that's most. That's most days when I go downtown. Yeah. And um, and. And it's building a brand new tower, and it's doing the new expansion because the demand is there, and it's affordable. And for investors, they're going to make incredible amounts of money on that in that market. But if you're sitting in Abbotsford and reading the reading the the stories all about the Vancouver market and how it's going to collapse, you wouldn't take action. It's the same thing as people who are buying into you know REITs or um, you know any other LPs. Type of thing with, 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 that are investing in specific Canadian real estate markets, and they they they'll read a report like you're you're that one or any of the other ones that are around, and they'll go, oh my God, what have I done? And, yeah, and no, my my theory and my 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 pledge is to continue to peel the onion and make sure you're constantly peeling the onion behind the headlines, because frankly, you know. Um, if you look, they may have a product, for instance, those guys who did that mm -hmm. consulting, may happen to have a product that you can buy that can short the market. Okay. But what if I was to, Pete, you're selling windows and I'm selling windows. My job is to sell those windows and tell everybody how unbelievably great those windows are. And here are the reasons why. And hey, by the way, this one that Peter's selling, kind of crappy. Here's the reasons why. And so if you, if you peel the onion, you start to dig a little bit behind a lot of this research, you start to see, okay, now I get it. Now well, I get it. Right. You know, the, uh, and, and I don't mind, uh, I, don't, I can't remember the individual's name, so I'm not calling him out, but there was uh, someone from a uh, hedge fund investor out of San Diego, San Francisco, somewhere in California, who was calling out the Vancouver housing market and claiming that the, the housing Canadian housing market is going to collapse. And he got a lot of airplay in the Vancouver media here uh, of about a month, two, month or two ago. And it was interesting. I happened to know some of the information behind the scenes. He had shorted the market. Um, and specifically, he was... Uh, uh, shorting home trust, home equity bank, because that was the bank that came <laughs> out with. Uh, he he thought they were a subprime lender, just like the American subprime lenders. Yeah, yeah. And forty five mortgage brokers had submitted fraudulent um, documentation with regards to falsifying income verification, and it right. became massive headlines. Like, uh, and and all of a sudden, this guy said, "Ah, that's the tip of the iceberg. I'm going to short." Canadian um, housing uh, and Canadian, yeah. and which really meant he was going to short home home capital or home trust uh, stock. Well, the reality was, even if there was some, I mean, these mortgages were on stated income mortgages anyways. They had some solid, strong fundamentals. It didn't mean all forty-five of the, those the brokers clients went into default. It just meant that some of the documentation was accurate. You always and, have to look behind the curtain, Pete. You and uh, what's interesting that. in that particular scenario, and I think it's worth mentioning here. Um, the uh, 
the, the lender in question is thriving and doing perfectly fine without a blip. So a year later, this individual who shorted them is kind of going, oh my God, you know, they're not collapsing. So what does he do? He goes into the media and the Vancouver market saying, yep. it's got to collapse. <laughs> I found that very interesting. It's got to for him. <laughs> yeah, because if it doesn't, he's going to lose millions. But, and, but, uh, but it comes oh my God, the, this, foreign, the foreign buyer tax, it's making the Vancouver housing markets just collapse. It's going to be out of control, Pete. That's what I heard the other day. And, and even before the tax came in, we predicted three to six months of turmoil. Hmm. Just like in Toronto, for those of you listening in Toronto, you, you will probably remember when the second land transfer tax was put on on the city, guess what? Everybody said, that's it for Toronto housing market. It's over. Nobody's going to buy and pay two taxes. Are you kidding me? Well, since then, of course, the Toronto market has been a, a remarkable performer. And as a matter of fact, they, they came out the other day and said there's a actual inventory shortage of condos in, in Toronto. So uh, it's amazing. It, it, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting to peel that onion. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking, why don't we do this? Why don't we go around the horn and talk about different markets specifically? We've been we've been touching on some macro uh, topics and sure. and Lord knows there's lots of those to share and talk about. Let's dig a little deeper and let's uh, talk about some very specific. Uh, we'll start in Vancouver and work our way across the country. How's that? Housing market um, in Vancouver is contiguous even in and of itself. I think it's really important to uh, understand that if you are buying. In a, in, in a market such as this, uh, you have to be prepared for, you know, I guess another five months of turmoil and headlines and people freaking out. Um, but if you're buying and you're actually getting cash flow, which is very difficult in Vancouver, um, then you're okay. But if you're buying and hoping that the values are going to keep going up and up and up at this speed, that's speculative. And um, you may want to do that. That's totally up to you. But um, there are probably some better choices geographically in the lower mainland uh, in which to move your capital for where the market's going. Take a look. And, and I know Surrey's done incredibly well, mm -hmm. but, you know, the federal government keeps promising. You know, they've only spent $8 million on infrastructure, $8 million in the first year. It's crazy. Anyway, whole different story. <laughs> don't go down the, that rabbit hole. No, don't go down there. And, uh, but the... Um, they keep promising all this infrastructure dollars, and Surrey's on the list to achieve uh, a bunch of that money to build transportation. So if you're strategic in your buying, you know that the millennials are coming, and the millennials are 27% of the population, which is the same size as baby boomers. Mm. So us baby boomers kind of changed the world a little bit. By the way, we also had the beards and long hair and the cool uh, mat jackets, just kind of like what's happening now again, but that's there a different go. story. But uh, so they're going, th their predilection is towards transportation, um, is towards um, like kind of hubs where there's commercial as well as residential. And uh, so maybe buy for what's coming, what, where the demand is going to come to. New West is going to be very, very good. You're going to see in certain areas of Surrey, you're going to see, now they're just sticking in the lower mainland, right? Yeah. And now what's happening is in Abbotsford, they're, they're creating three different hubs in the city where they're going to have densification. It's going to be walkable. Right now it's not. As you know, it's a very car-oriented uh, city. Yeah. And, and they're changing that. And that's going to attract the millennials and the jobs because it's much more affordable out in the valley. Now, and, John, was, uh, was, was Abbotsford one of the 22 uh, areas uh, that was uh, covered by the foreign buyer's tax? No. Abbotsford's outside the foreign buyer's tax, but I don't ah. think you're going to see a whole lot of, of foreign buyers racing their money out to buy an Abbotsford townhouse, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, a lot of foreign money, as you, as you heard from the, even just from that Boston report, you know, you see they, they think that Canada is contiguous. I, I doubt if Abbotsford's even on the radar. Right. right. For us, as investors, you know, there's good opportunity. Cologne is pretty expensive. Uh, and difficult to get cash flow, uh, but you can find cash flow like in Cranbrook. Mm -hmm. But once again, um, you you have to understand that the far the farther you are, and this is something I really wanted to talk about, Pete, because I keep seeing these people promoting buy in these small towns. You're going to make off like a bandit. You're going to buy in Sarnia. Or you're going to buy in all these small towns, right? This is, seems to yeah. be a new thing that's being taught. 
Well, that was also taught in the 1990s. It was called penturbia. And, um, <laughs> and, and that didn't turn out so well. Because in smaller centers, if you don't like risk, um, if you don't like risk, don't be buying in, in really small centers. Why? Because if the horse leaves, pun intended, but if, the, mm -hmm. uh, but if one of the industries leaves or say even 200 to 300 jobs get cut because of something, it can have a dramatic impact on, um, on the housing market demand. Uh, in a bigger city, which, you know, Abbotsford's 100 and some thousand, uh, Vancouver, you know, all those types of cities that are a little bit more diverse. I know we're still sticking in um, the lower mainland. But it, more diverse, you're going to win in the long term. It, it, you, you will feel, and, and, and I think, Pete, you and I both have done this and bought in smaller centers, not very many, but not in, in smaller centers where yep. the cash flow is killer. It's just unbelievable. And the houses and the condos, are so, they feel so cheap because you're used to Vancouver or Toronto or Winnipeg kind of prices. And, and then suddenly the oil and gas industry or the coal or the jail or whatever the thing is goes away. And uh, Windsor, for instance, right? It's not that small, yeah. but, you know, I have seen three different uh, promotional cycles go through Windsor because it looks like it's going to be awesome. Hey, I can right. get $180,000. I can get a duplex. Duplex. I know. I mean, that's, but, uh, that's the same price as a parking spot in Vancouver, my goodness. Well, and you're getting positive <laughs> cash flow. Well, there's Why that. By but, 10? And, and they're going to build a bridge, Don. Did you know they're going to build a bridge? Yeah, because bridges bring a lot of jobs. The... Uh, they, you know, the, the, there are lots of bridges for the, uh, I mean, lots of jobs, well, you build it, but then it's over. So those duplexes that you're talking about were like $100,000 just a few years ago. But right. it's been promoted like crazy because, frankly, I've looked at Windsor three times over the years. I go, it has to work. It's right next to Detroit. It's right on the border. There's all the jobs, and then there's no jobs, and there's automotive, but then the automotive goes away. And it's just, it's really quite interesting. I would love I would love it to win. Yeah. But I'd, frankly, if you do the research, the actual research for long term, it's not as great as you feel. Uh, on that note, I, I wanted to actually point out to the listening audience uh, two quick things. One, I, just a housekeeping thing I forgot is if you have a question, type in your question and send that over to me. There is a box on your uh, on the screen there that you can type in questions. Uh, but Don, uh, you also run, you're one of your primary roles now as a senior analyst, you run a research, cutting edge research company. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what you do. I mean, I'm not sure that everybody understands that. They, they may know you as the, the voice and face on the stage at a rain meeting, but behind Okay, the I'm a geek. You say it. You yeah, say well, it out loud. He's a geek. <laughs> Seriously, folks, this guy is a geek. Um, I should go back to your picture uh, and put that up. No, on no, moving on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, that's important to, to, to point out that, that you guys, you and your team do a lot of research. So um, if you don't mind, I'm going to throw out a, a couple of cities, okay? So, oh, I'll throw out okay. a city and then give me your, your opinion, okay? Okay, wait a minute, wait um, a minute. Just, just have to have a sip, sip of this espresso. Okay, go. There you go. Okay, it's like speed dating with cities and real estate investing. Uh, Victoria, let's, start, let's go from the west. Victoria. Oh, Victoria is good. Um, there's a bit of a bit of an issue around the condos, um, but uh, generally it's going to be. It's like a. It's it's a government town, so yeah. it has stability. It's never going to be. Spe I love Victoria, but the economy. I mean, the, uh, the housing market's never going to be spectacular. And that's okay because I like boring cities, not boring economically cities, mm -hmm. uh, for and boring real estate markets because the ups and downs aren't uh, anywhere near as as um, bad as they are in other cities that are um, not as stable but have lots of highs and lots of lows. So Victoria, right. and because of the, you know it, it is on the Victoria is on the foreign investor radar, so you know that would that that would also assist in its value increases. Are you uh, anticipating or do you have any expectation that the 15% foreign buyer tax in Vancouver will push some business to the island? That it will. Uh, not to the island, but to Victoria. Right. And it, but yeah. Courtney Comox? No. None yeah. of the foreign buyers? Not on the radar. No. They'll be, and, and I'll tell you right now that some, some realtor or somebody's going to tweet out, oh, I can't believe that Don said there's no foreign buyers. I'm dealing with one right now. There's foreign buyers everywhere, people. That's, <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. You know what? And here's the reason why. Guess what? We're on sale. 
But Don, the yeah. prices are so crazy. Yeah, but our dollar is seventy-five cents. So those people were buying when the dollar was at a dollar par. And as a matter of fact, I, I've got a bunch of. I should send this to you. There's a there's a there's an uh, an article that we've got here that shows how it looks from a. Uh, a I think it was the Chinese investor we took. Let me just see if I can find that Pete while you're talking, because it was. Well, now you want um, me to talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for a change, right? Yeah. There you go. That's but, what you're uh, the guest. But, but, but yeah. frankly, we're on sale. It's like buying real estate at Winners right now. It's seventy-five. Mm. You know, to, it's twenty-five percent off, and then the foreign buyer tax goes on, and then the average sale price of those upper-end homes, which a lot of foreign investors have bought, has dropped by I don't know, fifteen percent. Hmm. So and, that, and right now, what the what they're doing, just like the second land transfer tax, and by the way, they're talking about a land transfer tax in Ontario and in Toronto. I mean, not a land transfer tax, but a uh, foreign, foreign foreign buyer's tax. tax. Well, you're going to see the exact same thing if they put that into place. It's going to go down, and then the headlines are going to scare everybody, and you you have to peel the onion to see that a lot of it is because of it's the three million and two million dollar properties that aren't being bought. There was four hundred and twenty. Uh, foreign buyers. Now that's there's more 50. Vancouver issue. So. What's that? You're talking more Vancouver, though, right? Yeah, I'm talking Vancouver, but but the same thing would happen if Toronto did the same thing. Yeah. So anyway, so Victoria will will feel some positive effect, and there are foreign buyers in every city. They're in in every small town. Just the, like when I say there's no foreign buyers, like the, I'm talking about, there's not a wave of them going. Yeah, on the upper island. Okay, let's move a little bit west and uh, Whistler. This is an interesting market because Whistler and uh, uh, Squamish in that corridor has a lot of appeal to some investors, but there's a lot of speculation because you're now dealing with resort type property. So just touch on that quickly. Well, uh, you know, recreational property is 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 fraught with a lot of issues. Um, and uh, but you can do very well in it, but it's always the first one to go if the economy changes, or in this, in in fact, if the government changes when everybody's confidence goes away. Um, so you start to see that happen in in Whistler. It's you're into that. You either have to know exactly what you're doing for renting out of condos and renting out of that property to get revenue. Um, it, I, I I I don't see it as the place where you're going to build your retirement. But maybe the place where you're going to go to retire. So yeah. if you can buy, if you can buy something in there that you want to eventually retire to, if that's where you want to retire, and you can get it to cash flow now, you're going to do fine. But um, yeah, is there, once again, small town, three years of crappy, crappy snow. You can't rent it out. <laughs> now you're negative cash flow. Yeah. Oh my God, what can do you, I do? Can you absorb the worst case scenario? You know, sometimes I find Don. A lot of people will justify a lifestyle choice and <laughs> call it an investment. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm getting a couple questions coming in here. One was Sunshine Coast. Uh, Love Sunshine Coast, area. but once again, the ferry access is um, is always a detriment. I have looked at Sunshine Coast. I've uh, I've researched it. I've done it. Almost bought a farm there, but um, but it's a great place to live. It's a great yeah. place to hang out. It's a great place, and we all get we all get holiday brain when we go over there, right? Oh my God, can you imagine if we had this place? It's right on the water, etc. Um, it's it's the prices have moved substantially from where they were five years ago, and um, they'll probably be fairly stable. But is this a place where you're going to buy for cash flow? Because I'm talking about investments on this call, right? Yeah. Um, if you're going to buy for cash flow, uh, probably not. There you go. Let's shift into northeast. Uh, or, yeah, northeast of uh, British Columbia. We seem to be hanging North. out in the west coast here, Pete. Well, we're, we're trying to make our way across. I'm trying to get my way across the pro the pro country here. <laughs> <laughs> well, with LNG and, and 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 the federal government change and uh, all that stuff that's gone on there, um, you know, they, the site C dam is going to be a big win for that that area. You know, it's going to be high in high in employment during construction phase. Um, they have a they, they have a um, a lot of people went in and developed on the uh, presumption that LNG was going to go right away, which which in fact it looked like it was going to, and now there's so there's a bit of a supply issue, so you can pick up some good deals, uh, but you do have to have very good managers up there, and uh, when Site C starts to kick in, they have to be aggressive with your rents, get the rents back up. 
when the when all the employment comes in. Yes, I know there's going to be a camp there, but just like at Fort McMurray during the boom time, you got people in camps and you got people in the city, and, and uh, some people don't want to live in the camps, etc. But yeah, so that's that's the situation up there. I, I'm curious. I I I personally have always been a little nervous about uh, that area, uh, like uh, you, you with with the uh, environmentalists and protests. Do you, is there a chance that the site C could just get stalled in this never-ending loop of people protesting? And everything and, gets. I think everything's getting stalled now because um, it seems like small groups have cracked the code on how to manipulate the game, and that's and that's on resource. That's on. Uh, densification in Vancouver and Toronto, it's like everywhere. Some so, pipelines. Uh, well, there's pipelines too, well, yes. But let's be honest, they got from some pretty big support from the federal government now uh, that seems to support that agenda. That's exactly right. And um, But but I think that, you know, there's rhetoric and then there's reality. And um, some, of the, some of the reality of the economics is really starting to set in. Um, like, let's go over to Alberta. Alberta right now Perfect is... Time. Um, Good segue. Hey, nice, not bad, eh? <laughs> the, um, the, the Alberta percentage of revenue from oil and gas into the government revenue is the, exactly the same as it was when the first well was discovered. Can you imagine that? So it's way hey, down. That, Wendy. I, I lost you on that. Okay, so, so in 1940, whatever it was, when they discovered that first well, uh, the first oil well, and they went, oh, what do we got here? There, the percentage of revenue that went into the uh, percentage of the government revenue that came from royalties from oil and gas okay. was obviously very low. Um, today, it is at that low point for the very first time since then. Mm. So the you've percentage got, of revenue, percentage of revenue into the government, it's it's remarkable. And I can send you the I can send you that graph if you want to send it out to everybody later. Sure. But it's it, it's remarkable, but it's it's also the reality. So. You know, you can be, your job as a politician generally is to do whatever it takes to get reelected, frankly, because it's your job, right? And that's how you get paid and you get to feed your family. And, you and during your that period of time, you want to you wanna make, quote, a difference, how whatever you decide is what a difference is, like spending $100,000 to move from Ottawa or from Toronto to Ottawa, so, something like that. But let's not go down that road. The, um, the, as we walk down this path, you start to see, all these things that the Alberta government wants to do, but there's no money coming in. And so you've got no money coming into Alberta on the royalty side, and then you've got Ottawa with their hand out because they need to do equalization payments because poor old Ontario and poor old Quebec keep overspending. Hey, where's our money? Uh, we, we, we live off that equalization payments, another $10 billion I heard yesterday. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, but there's no, nobody left putting the money in the pot. You know, the British Columbia is one of them, but that's it. So wow. now they look around and they go, we got to get a pipeline. We got to get this money back or we're going to lose the, because we're not going to be able to write checks from Ottawa to get votes in Ontario and in Quebec. So what are we going to do? Um, so we, there, there's going to be something that's going to happen that's going to have to generate revenue in that, in that province. Edmonton is really fairly well protected. Uh, so far, they've had some mega, mega projects uh, that have been going on and building up their transfer, big transportation projects, and um, they're not they they're less impacted by oil and gas at the city of Edmonton is than Calgary. Diversification. Well, there's that, and uh, the sad part is um, the legislature's in Edmonton, yeah, and they have hired. Tens of thousands of people, literally, I, I saw the number and I just can't remember exactly, it was 47 or something, thousand people since they've been elected to, on, to the government payroll, be it uh, whatever, their, whatever the roles are. And so that's protected the downturn. In, in Calgary, it's mostly oil and gas and head offices and a bit of a distribution and transportation, et cetera, but no real mega projects. So what we're, we, we're witnessing down there is what Edmonton could be achieving in two years from now, or it could be stable. Not all going to be depending uh, dependent upon what comes out of that provincial government and if the federal government starts getting things rolling on some of these infrastructure projects. So that's why Calgary is, it hasn't collapsed, but that's why it's 
hurting a lot more than than Edmonton is. Interesting. You know, I, I want to spend a little bit, a few minutes here on Alberta because, uh, again, when we talked, we, we started out this conversation and said there's no such thing as a Canadian real estate market. Well, you could almost argue there's no such thing as an Alberta real estate market True. because even within, it, we, even within the city of Calgary, there's parts that can be phenomenal opportunities right now and parts you want to avoid. Um, and so when we talk about Alberta, clearly, I mean, we can't sugarcoat this, oil has had a massive impact. You've got an NDP government, and this is not a political statement, but let's face it. It's a policy, uh, the, policy statement. Yep. Policies are, are impacting. I mean, bottom line is there's there's been some, some areas that are, are uh, having significant um, job impacts. Uh, I, and again, I, you, know, you and I both own in the Peace River. Uh, we know there's 50% vacancy uh, in some of those areas. Uh, so, um, if we don't even have to go into obviously with um, uh, Fort, Fort, Fort McMurray and, and the fires and everything that's going on there. So let's just talk about the macro in Alberta and the impact of oil, the impact of government. Where, what kind of, what do you see as? Uh, let me put it this way: What would need to happen in order for us to see a turnaround? Because we we did come from the mid two thousands where it was boom time, and uh, buying in Alberta was a no brainer. You got cash flow; we were almost doubling in value in some cases, or tripling. Um, so everything was fantastic back in the mid two thousands. Now we've gone almost a pendulum swing, in, almost to an opposite extreme. Well, you know, two thousand and one, Kyoto was there, and everybody was saying, "Hey, shut it down! Alberta's going to end and die." And uh, the last one out, they're using the old bumper stickers from the from the eighties, right? Last one out, turn out the lights. Yeah. When Kyoto was announced, and then they were they said the exact same thing in two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine. I stacked up on real estate in, in Alberta, and, um, and 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 obviously have done incredibly well for, for, from from doing so, because our research showed that the next two years, from two thousand nine to two thousand eleven, were going to be tough but you could pick up some really good deals. Um, but we were picky, very picky, because we started to buy where transportation infrastructure was starting to be, to, mm -hmm. dollars were be, being spent. We were buying where millennials wanted to live. We, wanted, we started to buy strategically, not just buying something. And the thing had to carry itself. And, um, and even during the downturn, it carried itself. Even right now, um, because of the positioning of a lot of the buildings that we own, and the condos, etc., we're doing incredibly well. But if you if you um, if you look at today versus the uh, previous downturns, we always had some sort of event that the government was able to step in and stimulate more growth. Mm -hmm. um, and every downturn since the 80s, that's, that's occurred. Well, this time, it seems to be the exact opposite. And once again, we're not talking about the government's color of their signs. We're talking about policy. Mm -hmm. So from the feds, they kind of go, man, it's Alberta, eh, whatever. You know, we, we, there's, a, there's 17 voters there. We, we don't have to worry about it that much. And so you're not getting that understanding about the, the equalization payments and how much money that Alberta creates for, you know, that whole thing. And, yeah. and then from the provincial government, they, I think they believe, I think they truly, truly believe they only get a four-year run, and they're just trying to push all those policies and new contracts and new negotiations and, and minimum wages and all those things um, into place in the, next, in the next couple of years. So um, I'm on a buying watch currently. Mm -hmm. I am looking for deals currently, but I understand that I would be buying and holding for a minimum of five years, if not ten, in that area. So Okay, so let me ask you this, uh, because I know I, I, I made a comment uh, about a year ago that uh, if I was going to re-enter the Alberta market, I might wait until the, the halfway through the third term of the current government. And, the third uh, term? I, oh, my God. Third, sorry, third year. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> scaring people. Step away there. from the fence, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hunkering down for the long run. Yeah. The third year, uh, the, let's, let's assume, again, political colors aside, let's assume there's a change in government after this four-year term. Um, do you see that in and, in and of itself would be something that would create uh, optimism that might re-enter the market? And uh, it would create optimism, but but a change in government um, isn't the it won't it won't like oh my god finally now everybody goes and buys real estate right so yeah. it takes like two years of 
whatever the new policies, hopefully they have new policies, there are different mm. policies that, that help. You know, I, I see these people just making this all about a real estate story. Well, what do real estate people care? Like, well, frankly, they're all families. You know, these are homeowners. These are mm -hmm. people, you, you know, the, the towers, there's towers in Cal. We're spending way too much time on Alberta. We don't have that much time. We have, to, we have a whole country to go to. But anyway, um, we can do a whole thing on Alberta if you want. Um, I, I've got time. a bunch of things on donrcampbell.com. They can, they can read about Alberta. That I've that I've recently posted. Just go to donrcampbell.com. Right. Well, I, I got one it. question. One question here. I'll just throw it. Uh, with us in Calgary and Alberta coming close to 24 month period of this transition and downturn, and it doesn't seem the government is stepping in. What do you think is going to happen over the next 12 to 36 months? Oh, you're going to see a, 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 a the negative momentum um, accelerate in average sale price. If that makes sense. So, so the average sale price should be dropping more quickly in Calgary than we've seen because it takes 24 months of a GDP downturn to really have an impact on the housing market. And uh, you're, you'll start to see that occur. Um, you'll start to see some really good deals start to show up in the next year or so. Um, the I think that you'll find in Edmonton that um, it's a little bit more buffered from the downturn, so it won't feel it's momentum shift for another 16 months or so and um, yeah but the smaller centers once again it's like buying in the smaller centers of Ontario and wherever they you keep hearing these things being pitched the smaller centers are always the last to recover so um, so the, the Peace Rivers etc it's going to be a little bit of a longer haul and you have to be incredibly proactive but also a great time to re be renegotiating every contract that you've got, whether it's in repair and maintenance or in uh, not natural gas, but in in repairs and maintenance and and in construction and in carpet and in all those things um, that you need to do to run a building. Now is a great time to renegotiate those programs because you probably negotiated those deals and got quotes on replacement roofs, etc back during the boom times. Well now, people are being a little bit more realistic, so you could save yourself some time and money. Excellent. Well, again, due to uh, time, let's just skip across the country. No offense to those in the prairies. Uh, well, let me just say, but, but the difference is with Brad Wall in Saskatchewan is that they've got policies that are actually bringing drilling rigs online and bringing mm. jobs in. Same economics, like side left by left by right, <laughs> almost weirdly <laughs> a perfect pun. But yeah. Left, left by right, and you're seeing that the jobs are being created in Saskatchewan. As a matter of fact, um, the, the, the number of oil rigs took a jump up in, in Saskatchewan in the, last, in the last count. So once again, it's not about the color of their signs. It's about their policies and whether they're going to have an impact on family or not. Interesting. So jump across to Winnipeg, and Winnipeg is one of those cities that, got, uh, that did red, really, really well boringly well, one of those kind of cities, and uh, mm -hmm. it's still doing very well. But once again, there is so much enthusiasm for Winnipeg in the last year that it probably overshot its underlying economic fundamentals a little bit. And the landlord and tenant laws, if you're thinking about buying there on your own, uh, you really, really have to study those laws because there are some, shall we say, interesting um, rest restrictions that you have as a landlord if you're buying there. But interesting, yeah. yeah. Also, there's another area that you got to be really careful. I know some people were bragging about their checks were coming directly from the government. And, oh, yeah. And that, when that, the tenant that, left, they take that all day long. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was like, okay, generally was they don't bounce. Person. But if we keep on the same track, <laughs> yeah. In some uh, of these they, they, they also found yeah. those same properties uh, had a lot of uh, a lot of repairs after the tenant left. So they they uh, seem to yes yeah. The, the, the but, but I know lots of people perfect. who have done incredibly well in that city. It's it, it's it's been it's been very good for people. Um, if you jump over, Thunder Bay has been very interesting. Thunder Bay in Ontario is. Uh, um, the, what happened, of course, is the because of all the a, a, um, lack of pa pipelines, we started to see uh, issues with the number of trains on the rail because they started not being able to move other goods because there was so much oil on rail, and um, and so what happened, of course, is a lot of the cargo shifted to Thunder Bay instead of going all the way around. Uh, on rail, they just ran it to Thunder Bay and loaded it there. So that the port of Thunder Bay, believe it or not, 
um, was was thriving, seems to be still fairly strong. Um, so you can you know you, you can watch watch that trend there. I know some people are doing incredibly well in Thunder Bay. Uh, Sault Ste. Marie is really repositioning themselves as a high-tech center, trying to be like a third or fourth high-tech center in Ontario. Uh, might be a little bit early for you to be jumping into that market, but keep an eye on it. If we go down into, uh, let's go right down, and uh, we talked about Windsor already, so we'll go a little bit north, and Hamilton. Um, Hamilton yeah, there are a lot continues. of questions about Hamilton. Oh, this still continues to be a strong city, a growing economy, um, I know we called it, I was on the, that George Strombolopoulos show, The Hour on CBC, and I don't know, it was how many years ago was that, seven or eight, mm -hmm. and uh, when I said Hamilton's the place, if I had to put money into Ontario, it would be in Hamilton, and the look on his face was, was remarkably enjoyable, because he was off camera, <laughs> he's going, what, are you kidding, have you been there? And it's that's because we look at things with research, we don't look at things with, um, jaded eyes like as if we lived there we look at it from a research point of view okay so right here's where they're going here's the affordability here's the go train that's going in now they have an LRT on the um, on paper so they're there that'll make it more millennial you've got McMaster uh, University high tech their high tech center there I just lost the name but there's a right in town and so what that did for Kitchener Waterloo Cambridge is it became a place for those people who graduated out of McMaster to stay in the city, but you have mm. to be attractive for they the young people. Work. So yeah, they, they, well, what happened is they wanted the small businesses to start growing in Hamilton. And we're starting to see that, and with, if LRT ever gets done there, you're going to have construction jobs, and then uh, you should be buying along the station where the stations are going to be. But Don, it's really difficult to do. Yeah, it is. So <laughs> get on with it. <laughs> so that that's good. The prices have gone up substantially. There are some streets and neighborhoods with, that you may wish to avoid still, but uh, that's that's why you need an on uh, a really good expert who's on site, like in that city, that knows it inside out, not just trying to sell you something. So don't don't just go hop online and uh, buy sight unseen because somebody told you it was a good idea. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea, man. So we go from there. Kitchener Waterloo, Cambridge, obviously the, the tech triangle is thriving. It's great. There's a landlording, landlord licensing issue in that area that costs you a lot of money for a whole lot of nothing, um, but uh, you can find some fantastic deals. A little bit, little bit overbuilt for student housing at the moment, but as the uh, as the universities begin continue to grow in size, that'll get absorbed. Um, yeah, well, here's an interesting one. If you go a little bit, uh, a little bit farther north and a little bit east, um, Grimsby. St. Catharines, yeah, I know. Grimsby, St. Catharines, that kind of area has been so under the radar, and appropriately so, but what's happened is they've announced that Go Train is going to start doing right. regular service down there. Go Train, for those of you who aren't in Ontario, is like Sky Train combined with West Coast Express. Right, it's, right. So it's, a, it's like a train commuting system. Anyway, so that this will take a Go Train that will take you into... Um, right into to Union Station, into Toronto, and great stops all on the way. So people can actually live out there, not fight the traffic. So you are going to see that about a year after the station opens. Like right now, there's a bunch of speculation that goes on, and then it slows down. And, that, and then a year after the station opens, you're going to see the demand for rentals and purchases and, and uh, people moving their families out to these smaller centers and still living in, and are still... Um, working downtown Toronto. So that's a big deal and a big opportunity. I, yeah, I remember years ago you talked about the Barry Aurelia area and the yeah. train had a significant impact there. Oh, my goodness. It's just been amazing. And then in Aurelia recently, Hydro One has, has made a commitment to open up a, a large high-tech center. So they're going to be bringing in high-income, high-tech type jobs in little old Aurelia. I remember we started talking about Aurelia, oh, my goodness, 15 yeah. years ago. And people said, why are you buying in cottage country? And I said, because it's not going to be cottage country for very long. No kidding. And, uh, so or Barry's been great. Like, they filled up the parking lot for the GO train like nothing. So the, the, there's so much uptake from people from Toronto moving to Barry, And, of course, that ripples a little bit farther north to Aurelia. And now with this thing that Hydro One's going to do in Aurelia, 
holy mackerel, it's, yeah, it's a great spot. It's a great spot. Winter wow. and summer. It, go over to Ottawa. Really interesting. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Keep going. Uh, we got about five minutes here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you guys <have> up. <laughs> so, so zipping it over, zip over to Ottawa, where I'm going to be on Wednesday. Can hardly wait. Come to the rain meeting. It's going to be great. And uh, so they've got their new O, not their new O train, but a, a leg of the O train being built, which is like the Sky Train, and which is like the TTC in Toronto, etc. Um, so what? That that's providing fantastic opportunity for people who are going to be buying within 800 meters of each station because that's where the millennials are going to want to live. Um, Ottawa once again hiring a lot of people. It's a stable market. Yeah, you're probably never going to hit a home run, but that's okay. That also means you're never going to strike out. Um, mm -hmm. So you're not swinging for the fence. Kind of like, like the David point. Ortiz. Take David Ortiz for instance. And uh, oh, hey, well, now you're talking my language. Yeah, the, the strikeout. I know. I got that. <laughs> anyway, and <laughs> sorry, but anyway, so Ottawa is, is providing cash flow, but you have to be a little bit more picky. Um, I think that you will find that they're seriously, seriously keep talking and talking about secondary suites and lane laneway housing and coach housing, like second in essence second suites that stand in the backyard. Um, you're starting to see that become a, a need and Weirdly, the city council is actually talking about it and having consultations around it and doing some great stuff around that kind of densification. So mm -hmm. that's great. Opportunity. Um, uh, Hal uh, Halifax, man, if they ever start building those, <laughs> start building those announced ships, it's yeah. going to go crazy. But unfortunately, a lot of people went into Halifax on the announcement, not not waiting for you know things to start happening. And uh, and so that drove the prices up faster than the underlying fundamentals. You're starting to see some. Uh, I love Halifax. What a beautiful city! And mm -hmm. you're starting to see some stuff happening there. Um, but it'll take a while to catch up to the fundamentals. And that uh, yeah, big team of which is jobs. Yeah, 100 percent. You need jobs and not that, that are going to jobs. attract people. Um, and and yeah, and it's incredibly affordable. So mm -hmm. you, you you can do that and. And if, if, if Quebec figures this out, by the way, that if here's, – here's a funny thing about Energy East Pipeline, because that would be a very positive effect for New Brunswick, but also for Quebec. Because mm. if they run it through there, uh, they, they're going to be helping to sell more Alberta oil and also save themselves – I think it was $10 billion a year. Wow. In, uh, yeah, I know. It's, it's crazy, but it's political, so, you know, of course it's crazy. Uh, they would say they sell $10 billion a year, but not only that, they would support Alberta. Alberta's economy would grow. Therefore, there would be even more equalization payments going to Ottawa, which <laughs> Quebec would get. But uh, wow. it's, pretty, it's pretty hard for them to kind of see that process. right? Now, you, you know, that's just silly talk, Don. That's just logical, you're, silly talk. Don't, 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 don't use logic and governmental policy in the same sentence. It just <laughs> Exactly. People. And, and frankly, um, if you've got uh, like a REIT or an LP, I'm not, I'm not recommending that you do that. I'm not allowed to say that. Um, but I'm saying that if you, if you don't want to do it yourself, you might want to look at some of these other options, financial mm -hmm. options, that will help you to take advantage of these and make sure that there's somebody smart running it and make sure that they know what they're doing and, and, and have a good track record. Instead of just some clown who says, hey, I hear real estate's awesome. I'm going to go and spend 100 grand to get an LP set up. And then go buy whatever you whatever they will feel like. Absolutely, um, go look at that track record. Massive opportunity, uh, but also higher risk right now. Now I don't mean the LPs, but I mean you just have to be more, pay more attention, because your neighbor's going to lean over on the fence, um, or, or if you're in the condo, in in the elevator, and go, oh, dude, here's the real estate, here buying in real estate, hey, eh? oh man, you must be afraid. And the only thing you should really do is just say, no, I'm not. But I'm not, I'm not here to teach you about it. You know what? I, I'm good. But I refuse, absolutely refuse, to lower my expectations, even if the governor of Bank of Canada says, and oh, to lower your expectations. I ain't going to do wow. that. I, neither should anybody on this call. And Don, you, 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 I, I just want to touch it because you, you skipped over it. I'm not sure if it was intentional or yeah, you, you missed a small city there uh, called Toronto. Toronto. Uh, Toronto. Is that, well, that's just, that's just south of Barrie and Aurelia, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a go train that goes there now. <laughs> Lots of them from all <laughs> over the place. 
Yeah, did I skip over that? That's funny. Oh, that's because you took, I was going north up the highway and you took that <laughs> very early. I get it. We're okay. just following right. the highway. I, so yeah. I, 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 we're, we're, we're up against the clock a little bit, let's, uh, but you know, this is in fact. Toronto, Toronto's, a, Toronto's a, an incredibly strong market that the, they, like Vancouver, they're very restricted under the Places to Grow Act and uh, the lakes uh, about, about land. So that's why you're seeing the average sale price move, uh, move a lot, just like Vancouver did. Uh, because it's the land, the underlying land that's got the value now because it's mm. so restricted. Uh, if you look at a graph of Vancouver, demand. yeah, Vancouver's condo price and and Toronto's condo price, you'll notice that it's a relatively flat average median sale price compared to single family homes and anything that's ground oriented, and that's why because restricted on the on there. So uh, condos are, are are getting it's getting increasingly more difficult to get um, uh, positive cash flow, for sure, and uh, like you have Vancouver. to be very picky, but if you're going to if you're gonna go along, there's a new TTC that's being built, a uh, subway in Toronto that's being built out to Vaughan, follow that, take a look at where those stations are going to be, and if you don't believe me, rent a helicopter for a hundred bucks for an hour, and follow where the TTC, the subway state, uh, subway lines have gone in the past, the older ones. You don't even have to know because you won't see them from up there, but you will know exactly where they are because you could follow the density right out on each time you fly into Toronto. You see all these dense, uh, these dense lines. It's uh, mm -hmm. along the TTC, and I'm telling you, that's a, that would be the opportunity for me. And uh, I love Scarborough. I think it's going to be a great, a great play. And, of course, the junction, is, uh, uh, which is the other side of town, is really starting to gentrify and do do well, and we're, we're seeing the demand occur there and densification. So there is opportunity, but there's also, once again, not every property. Um, if you're going to buy in smaller towns, please don't buy the story and the myth. Please do your homework. Yes, you can get great cash flow. Oh, my God, it's great. But what are you prepared for when, that, when that, the, uh, the tap gets turned off? You know, it's a, it's a, it, the smaller towns have higher risk, higher reward. So um, just like anything, do your homework, please. Wow. God, I, I'm totally confused because uh, I was reading this report from a company out of Boston that said the Canadian housing market is crashing and all of a sudden. It is. It's we, over. We just, yeah. We, I forgot to say that. Oh, by the <laughs> way, it's over. Yeah, sorry. sorry. We just went coast to coast, and it would appear that if you actually did your homework and didn't think of the Canadian housing part, uh, housing market as one market and actually analyze your own geographic area and look for opportunities within pockets and did some research based on economic fundamentals there's still some opportunity out there yeah don't don't lower your expectation just change your plan and change your view and and and, and look for the opportunities um, there are risks in everything that you do and um, and and there will be people that tell you whatever you do, don't buy Apple stock. Whatever you do, don't buy this, and it'll go up 50 percent or 30 percent. And then it'll, and then you'll see people who say, now time to buy gold, and it'll go down 20 percent. Yeah, you, you kind of got to understand. You got to take everything, even this call, with a grain of salt. Yeah, I don't have anything absolutely. to sell. I have zero to sell. I'm just the research geek um, who no longer has a perm. <laughs> and um, I love I love what I do. I love being able to see these numbers and know these numbers, and after 24 years, see the patterns and see how they work. So if you liked it, that's awesome. Visit me, hang out with me, do whatever you need to do. If you didn't like it, I really appreciate that you spent however uh, was it's been an hour uh, of your time hour. listening in. And um, yeah, there's lots lots more to go on on this uh, on the the peeling of the onion. So well, I'll, I'll be here. All I can say is I'm glad you had a shot of a special before you started because that was did. one coast-to-coast -coast whirlwind tour. <laughs> thank you. I'm going to go have some dinner. Mr. Don R. Campbell, ladies and gentlemen. Don, thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, that was fantastic. We, you know, I, I can't say enough that uh, um, it, it was great having you on the call. I mean, we've been talking about doing this forever. And uh, Don, and I've been talking about having our own radio show forever too. But yeah. you know that was, we're too was busy. Too busy to have the fun bit. Yeah. 
<laughs> exactly. Uh, you know what? I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy travel schedule and, and sharing your absolute wealth of knowledge. I'm sorry I couldn't get to everyone's questions. I had a lot of questions there, and, but my goodness, if we were going to go coast to coast, we had to be on task and on target. And Don, uh, I think what really shines throughout all this is your absolute wealth of knowledge, and that comes directly from, A, years of experience, but also the research you guys do. Thanks, my friend. I, I really appreciate it, and um, it, always a pleasure to help. Excellent. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to let you know we're, we will be continuing our webinar series. Uh, tonight was part seven of my investment webinar series, and as usual, I interview the CEO or the owner or the, the operating partner of a particular investment opportunity or a company, or in this case, we're just talking real estate investment in general tonight with Don R. Campbell. And uh, next webinar series, part eight, is going to be on Wednesday, October 5th, same time, 6 o'clock to 7, and yes, I will change it on the, uh, the uh, opening screen there, uh, Wednesday, October 5th, 6 to 7 p.m., Espresso Capital, this is a very interesting company, and they operate exactly like a MIC, which is a mortgage investment corporation. We did an interview with AP Capital talking about how you can put money into a pool, and that company would then invest in mortgages against properties. Espresso invests in companies using shred credits, that's uh, tech credits from the government, it's a $3 billion industry annually here in Canada that virtually nobody knows about. So we're going to be talking to the uh, managing partner of Espresso Capital next Wednesday, or sorry, not next Wednesday, Wednesday, October 5th. So mark that in your calendar. That'll be part eight of the webinar series. In the meantime, I hope everybody has an absolutely awesome night, an awesome week. And remember, tune out the hype and pay attention to the facts and keep perspective regardless of what you're reading in the headlines, whether it's real estate, stocks, bonds, or whatever, perspective is the key. So again, thanks very much, Don R. Campbell, for joining us tonight. Ladies Pleasure. and gentlemen, have a fantastic week, and we'll tune in next time for Part 8, Wednesday, October 5th. Bye for now.